Um, thank you for all joining us, um, uh, both those that are um, first joining today and those that were able to join last week. Um, as a reminder, this is a four-part series on uh, safe prescribing and deprescribing of benzodiazepines, as well as talking about the benzodiazepine-induced neurological uh, dysfunction, which will be next week's. Um, last week's was recorded, um, and eventually that recorded will be posted. Our hope is to then do a professional recording of it that we can post and will also be eligible for CME. Unfortunately, the recordings of the live presentations are not eligible for CME upon watching the, the recordings of them. Um, anyway, I'm Dr. Alexis Ritbo. I am an addiction psychiatrist, an assistant professor of psychiatry with the University of Colorado, um, and the program director for our addiction psychiatry fellowship. Um, I am co-chair of the Benzodiazepine Action Work Group with the Colorado Consortium, along with Dee Foster, who will be one of the presenters next week. Um, and uh, I'm medical director for the Alliance for Benzodiazepine Best Practices, another nonprofit that is really involved in um, how we improve safe prescribing of benzodiazepines. Um, so uh, I know repeating for those that were here last week, but you know, became interested in this because both in general psychiatry and in addiction psychiatry, see a lot of patients on benzodiazepines. Um, uh, certainly that get started on them without good um, understanding of the long-term risks um, and then also get decreased or taken off of them too quickly or without good um, collaboration and understanding about the possible risks when um, decreasing and stopping these medications. So today um, we'll talk about the consequences of prescription benzodiazepine use and particularly uh, populations that are at high risk for these consequences. Um, and I'll let Dr. Jeff Gold uh, speak. And I will also just say that uh, uh, Jeff was one of my mentors and supervisors during residency and one of the people that really got me uh, interested in this. So it's been a real pleasure to collaborate with him. It certainly has. Thanks, uh, Dr. Ritvo. My name is Jeff Gold, and uh, I am a clinical pharmacy practitioner in psychiatry at the VA Medical Center. So I work under a collaborative practice agreement and have a scope of practice where I can prescribe uh, medications and I work very similar to a PA or nurse practitioner in the Department of Psychiatry and manage my own caseload of veterans. I also teach at the School of Pharmacy and the School of Medicine and I'm a faculty member with the Department of Psychiatry. I teach intro to psychopharmacology for the first year residents and a number of courses throughout the, um, the psychiatry residents training in their second and fourth year as well. Um, I became interested in benzodiazepines a number of years ago. I've always been fascinated by the history of psychotropic medications. And uh, I said last week uh, that benzos have one of the most fascinating histories of the medications that I've come to study. And it really has a, a large part to do with it was patients and not the medical community that largely recognized the dangers of benzodiazepines, that you could become dependent upon them, develop tolerance to them, and have experience withdrawal symptoms if they were abruptly discontinued. And that when benzodiazepines were invented in the 1950s, the 1955, there was such great excitement that they would replace barbiturates, which are very um, easy to overdose on, and they would be the mainstays of treatment for anxiety and a whole host of other conditions, and that they were much safer and didn't present the dangers that barbiturates did. But um, and by the 1970s, benzodiazepines topped all the most frequently prescribed drug lists in the country, in the United States. Uh, and it was really thought to be due to their safety profile, which we now know um, was understated. And they have many of the same risks of barbiturates, maybe not the same risk of overdose, at least by themselves, but the many of the same risks uh, were still present. And so the uh, relationship with benzodiazepines in our country has been very complicated. And by the 1980s, all the clinical guidelines and even a number of other groups had advocated for the restriction of these medications and they became controlled and more tightly regulated. So I think um, something I've always thought about that um, a mentor said to me many years ago, a retired psychiatrist, Dr. Uh, Michael Sturgis, that um, we were talking about prescribing medications and he had the, the term that if your problems didn't scare you, wait until you see our solutions. And I always remembered that as a way to think about that um, the dangers of some of the medications that we prescribe and how we must manage them thoughtfully and carefully. So, all right. Today, we're gonna to talk more about the consequences of prescribing benzodiazepines 
And specifically, we're going to look at some of the at-risk populations. Let's see if I got have control. We do. All right. So we're going to talk first about the relative contraindications. I'm going to just define relative contraindications in just a moment here. We're also going to describe some of the short and long-term consequences of using benzodiazepines. We're going to look specifically at some of the populations that are at greater risk for uh, consequences related to benzodiazepines. And finally, we're going to characterize the difference between physical dependence, misuse, and addiction to prescription benzodiazepines. First, we're to talk a little bit about what the term relative contraindications mean. So an absolute contraindication would be essentially no, never. This is not something that you would ever prescribe. You would never prescribe this medication if there was an absolute contraindication. Relative contraindications are a little bit more complicated in that generally it's advisable that these things would, you would not prescribe such a medication for these indications, but that there is room for clinical judgment. And there might be circumstances where it is appropriate to continue such medications, despite the evidence really suggesting that it's not necessarily um, a safe practice or an ideal practice, but sometimes in the reality of the situation and taken into the complete clinical context, it may be appropriate. I wanted to get Dr. Ritvo's opinion too about the term relative contraindication, because I know I've had a number of providers ask, what does that mean to them? I mean, I think it means that often, as you said, we there's there, there's risks and benefits with every choice we make, and, and we try to make that decision to the best of our ability and also should be doing so with the input from our patients um, and how, having them understand um, if a medication were prescribed, there's certain risks they have that would make it mean that our sense is the risk is greater than the potential benefit. But I also think, I, I think of this a lot when I have someone come to me already on long-term benzodiazepines, yeah. where going back, I probably would have tried to avoid starting them if there were other, you know, and try a bunch of other things. But now at this point, I worry about, um, stopping them or stopping them too suddenly. And so not using relative in contraindications as a reason to discontinue, it might guide you in, in recommending a, um, yeah. trying to taper or decrease the dose. Um, but yeah, I think, I mean, I think it speaks to, right. This is, um, our, our patients do not fit perfectly into the research or how these medications were studied. So. Yeah. I think that's well said. And I think oftentimes like a good example of when something that in the, say in the case of long chronic long-term benzos, where I think about what constitutes a relative contraindication versus an absolute contra contraindication would be something, for example, if somebody came to me and they are taking a benzodiazepine and they have PTSD and sleep apnea, but they've been on, let's say three milligrams of lorazepam every night for years it's not, I wouldn't say it's an urgency to get them off the medication, but I would hold this place of curiosity. Let's, how might you feel? How might you sleep better? How might your PTSD be better managed if you were to take less of this medication? And I'm curious about coming down on the dose, but it's by no means, would that be, an, would there be any urgency to it? Versus if I'm working with somebody and they come to me on chronic long-term benzodiazepines, and then a urine drug screen shows that they're using cocaine and illicit opioids, then I think that becomes more of an absolute contraindication where we're then talking more about a, a need to taper and you know, that we need to taper due to safety issues. So I think that just to kind of develop, develop the term, what relative contraindication might be thought of in the course of this presentation and how it can become an absolute contraindication in some cases. So we're going to talk about the relative contraindications, including active or history of substance use, concurrent opioids, a history of a traumatic brain injury, uh, current treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder, and then age-related concerns. To start talking a little bit about the risk of concomitant substances, when uh, benzodiazepines, of course, increase dopamine in the ventrotegmentalary and its connection to the nucleus accumbens, and that's essentially the final common pathway of reward for any drug that has a reinforcing or rewarding effect. And benzodiazepines, when they're combined with other dopamine enhancing drugs, exert an additive reinforcing effect. So that essentially can make these substances you know, more pleasurable or more potentially addictive. Uh, all central nervous system depressants generally have an additive effect on one another. That is, they further decrease like that the signaling from one brain cell to another brain cell. And so there's an additive effect in impairing cognition, coordination, memory, and there is an additive effect on producing respiratory depression as well. 
So this is a concern when these medications are, of course, prescribed together or when they're taking recreationally, for example, alcohol, anything that somebody might add. I had a patient who had recently um, uh, had pulled a muscle in their back and uh, they were given methocarbamol and that produced a really significant sedation that, in the subjective experience of the patient when combined with their benzodiazepine. So you really wanna make sure that patients are really well educated about the potential for central nervous system uh, depression when they add other substances prescribed or illicit to benzodiazepines. Some of the specific ones that we're concerned about, of course, is that when multiple mechanisms are overlapped with each other, there's the risk of accidental overdose and death when combining various CNS depressants. And a lot of the research shows that most overdoses that are accidental in nature are polysubstance overdoses. If you think about Heath Ledger or Amy Tryon, some of these famous examples, it's not that these individuals took too much of any one medication, it was just too much of maybe a multitude of substances. And in fact, benzodiazepines, the LD50, the dose at which half the people take it will die, is quite high. For some benzos, it perhaps doesn't even quite exist, or it's like an exceptionally high dose. But when you combine benzos with other substances, then the LD50 drops precipitously. Some, um, some particular concern around alcohol combined with benzos can cause and increase the amnestic properties of, of benzodiazepines. We know that it also decreases the protective upper airway reflexes. So there's an increased risk of inhaling vomit and developing, developing an aspiration pneumonia. Opioids and benzodiazepines, of course, we're gonna talk about in more depth throughout this presentation, but an opioid plus a benzodiazepine is essentially anesthesia. That's fentanyl and midazolam. That's a, a, a lorazepam and oxycodone for twilight sedation. And really opioids and benzos both work in the region of the brain responsible for respiratory control. So while benzodiazepines inhibit, um, have an inhibitory effect and, opi and opioids and, like reduce the excitatory effect, there's a synergistic um, respiratory depression when these agents are combined together. We know they also have an effect on uh, worsening sleep apnea and there's an elevated age adjusted fracture risk in men, presumably from becoming sedated and falling. Um, the risk of overdose, the, for, this is some data from 2011. This is some VA data that I've um, had access to through the VA. In 2011 and, and, and throughout even since that time, unintentional poisoning has been the second most common cause of accidental death in the United States behind car accidents. There have actually been months over the last decade where um, overdose deaths have actually exceeded that of car accidents, not consistently, but there have been times veterans are at much higher risk for um, accidental overdosing even versus the general population. So this is something that I see and talk about in my clinical practice um, um, regularly. And Dr. Ripple, are you taking uh, uh, I had that you were going to do this. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. My bad. Um, <laughs> there's further risk of overdose in, um, in the pandemic. Um, there were some researchers from the CDC who studied more than 180 million emergency department visits uh, prior to the uh, pandemic and since. And what they found is that all drug and opioid overdose emergency department visits did not decrease in a similar manner to other emergency department visits during the pandemic. Um, and weekly counts of all drug overdoses were up 45% or higher in 2020 than in 2019. And we talk about this too, because these things often go hand in hand. Yeah. So um, this is a, a graph some of you may have seen before. I was just able to pull up the one that actually was updated to include 2020 statistics. Um, so, you know, one of the things I will frequently explain when I have a patient that I'm continuing on benzodiazepines and I see in their prescription drug monitor and their medication list that they are also prescribed an opioid, or I um, know that they uh, have an opioid use disorder, um, is making sure they understand this risk, increased risk of um, overdose and usually vast majority are unintentional. So what um, you'll see is overall, of course, a big increase um, since 1999. Um, we had a small decrease in overdoses for which a benzodiazepine uh, was involved uh, in 2018 and 19, but then an increase above the max in 2020. And as we mentioned, alone benzodiazepines or without any opioid are rarely, uh, you know, are only a very small cause of 
overdose. So the gray thin line that is pretty stable, a little increased, but since 1999 is benzodiazepines without any opioid um, uh, being involved in, a, in the deaths versus the yellow line is benzodiazepines in combination with synthetic opioids other than methadone. Um, I believe the reason they excluded methadone is since uh, methadone's, uh, many of the patients uh, with methadone are prescribed it as part of um, opioid treatment program, opioid use disorder. Um, and so it's it's kind of a confounding factor trying to look at that. But um, so the other prescription opioids, and obviously, especially 2019 to 2020, you just see that line going up uh, heavily. Um, so um, as far as the overdose risk, this is a, a line that I have frequently repeated to my patients to try to um, help them understand why I'm really concerned about this risk when I see both on their list or even more so when I see that in the past they've had scripts here and there for an opioid, for injuries, surgeries, what have you, or, or for panic or something, and just want to make sure that they understand that their, their risk of overdosing from the opioid, but in combination with the benzodiazepine, increases five-fold, so five times during the first 90 days that there's an overlap in the prescriptions for an opioid and a benzodiazepine. And that's because that tolerance to the, you don't develop tolerance to the respiratory depression. Um, and so um, I tell them this is why I automatically prescribe um, Narcan to anyone where I know there's, I see there's a history of both meds or I know there's also a history of any um, opioid use disorder. Um, in 2016, um, this increase uh, in overdose in the combination of opioids and benzos led the, the FDA to make a black box warning about these serious risks when combining them. However, what they saw is when they did that, then there was a reflexic um, decrease in offering patients that were on benzodiazepines, either prescribed or using illicitly um, medication for addiction treatment for opioid use disorder. Um, and so in 2017, they went back and revised or created a new um, kind of warning or urged caution to say, you know, while we know this is an increased risk, we should not be withholding any addiction treatment for opioid use disorder, because in fact, we're decreasing their risk of overdose if they're on um, medication for addiction treatment, be that methadone or buprenorphine um, or Vivitrol. But, um, and so that should not be a reason to um, withhold the medication or try to take them off the, the benzodiazepine rapidly unless there's other contraindications. So I think it's really important that all prescribers um, know how to uh, tell patients how to use naloxone, how to prescribe it, um, and give them instructions. Um, luckily, uh, the Narcan spray the easy inhaler is now also generic because we used to have to deal with, and I'm sure they still exist, but they're hard to get. This the generic version had this complicated insufflator, and it was hard to find who which pharmacies carried it. Colorado does have a standing order, um, and many um, pr many pharmacies will honor the state standing order. Although what I found, having had several colleagues do kind of a, a secret. Um, uh, a secret shopper um, thing is that it really varies by pharmacy and pharmacy technicians um, who understands the standing order. So I would say whenever possible, it's best for a prescriber to put in the order. Um, one that also, you know, removes any um, shame a patient might have about asking for it. Um, it puts it on their medication list. I think there's just a lot of reasons um, to put it on there and make sure you're talking about it, but do know, I mean, I know the Safeway Pharmacy I go to, they do have a placard, sometimes more at the front and sometimes somewhat more hidden that says, you know, are you on an opioid? Ask me about naloxone. Um, and then here you'll see um, what we do know is even though it might be uh, relative contraindication, co-prescription is really common. So it is really common um, that uh, patients are co-prescribed an opioid and a benzodiazepine, and that has only increased. So again, if uh, the blue is um, any CNS depressant, the orange isn't with an opioid, um, and then the, I guess, teal uh, is an opioid or uh, CNS depressant um, with a benzo, uh, we know that in 20, I think it was for 2015, 35% of patients 
receiving a benzodiazepine script had a, a co-prescription for an opioid. So um, it's just really important that we're talking to patients about this risk. Um, I saw there was a question about what about the risk when a patient has been on a benzodiazepine and opioids for years? Um, you know, I haven't found exact numbers. What I tell, what I have seen and is that if patients have some other cause of decompensation, like a pneumonia, um, heart failure, suddenly they can become um, intolerant of the doses that they've previously tolerated. And you can see altered mental status falls. Um, uh, so I think, you know, they're not totally immune from um, being at risk for, from that combination if their system gets further um, decompensated. Um, Jeff, I don't know if you have other thoughts about yeah, I, I think that's well said. I know that there, when other medical issues like present themselves, they suddenly can be increasingly susceptible. But in the case where there's like longstanding tolerance, of course, there, you wouldn't just, again, the, the whole idea of relative contraindication that even when, you, when you're exploring coming down on the dose of the benzo and or the opioid, you'd be doing this really slowly in a supervised setting. It doesn't represent like an emergency in my mind, particularly if somebody is tolerant to the medicines. But I do know there are circumstances where people can become increasingly susceptible. And I would say one of the most important things that has come to my attention in people who are on, who are tolerant to high dose and long-term opioids and benzodiazepines is that they understand that they're only tolerant now to that dose. And as they come down, like going up on the dose of the medicine can actually, um, could be very dangerous. Unfortunately, and I, I, I think I mentioned this before, I'd worked with one patient some years ago who was successfully tapered off of long-term opioids and long-term benzodiazepines, who then went back to taking their historical dose and overdose and unfortunately died from doing that. So I, I think that lots of education needs to be in place around like the concept of like tolerance when in those circumstances as well. Yeah, I think that's, um, yeah, very well put and um, just something to make, to make sure patients under understand and it, that it can fluctuate. Um, so uh, I think Jeff, you're taking. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So the, um, the, more to benzos and concurrent opioids. So approximately 20 to 50% of patients on long-term opioids also take a benzodiazepine. Interestingly enough, patients taking long-term opioids are 12.5 times more likely to be prescribed long-term benzodiazepines compared to patients with chronic pain and who are not on opioids. So essentially, this is to Dr. Ribbo's point, to Alexis's point, that these medications are frequently prescribed together, and they're also more likely to be co-prescribed in patients with a history of substance use disorders, mood disorders, and anxiety disorders. I can't say why this data is. But, um, I think that one might speculate about why that might be, but essentially, in some of the populations where these things would be of greater concern, it's more they're more frequently prescribed. And both of these medications um, are, prescribed, uh, are frequently prescribed for chronic use despite uh, good evidence for long-term efficacy. And that's specifically with respect to, uh, there are some circumstances where long-term opioids are appropriate, but in many circumstances, they're not. For different forms of pain, it really depends on what you're treating. And the same is true for benzodiazepines outside of some of the indications we talked about last week. And even then, you know, they are generally considered second line treatments, unless they're one of the unique things that we talked about last week. And you can reference our slides from then for more information. This, this next slide is something that, um, that I put together and then, um, and is also kind of a consensus about ways to address some of the complex situations that arise when you're managing a patient on benzodiazepines and concurrent opioids. And I'll have Alexis comment um, as well, but these are generally good recommendations to follow for even just benzodiazepines alone or opioids alone. This is, these are just some general safe practices. And one is you just avoid the combination whenever possible. Again, many of the people we're talking about, I think are folks that have been on benzodiazepines for many, many years. It's not that we're newly starting the benzodiazepine. We're, we're pretty clear about that. 
And if the combination is to be used, you want to do this really carefully through active involvement of the whoever's prescribing the benzo and whoever's prescribing the opioid need to be working together. And ideally, only that person should be only the, the person responsible for the benzodiazepine should prescribe any benzodiazepine. And only the person prescribing the opioid should be responsible for, for prescribing any opioid. Um, you want when possible to use a lower dose than if you were using either agent alone. You want to consider short-term prescriptions with minimal refills, so you're overseeing this, you're providing frequent follow-ups, and then there are some uh, combinations that you want to avoid in particular, and that's um, when possible methadone for pain with benzodiazepines, and that has to do with just the long half-life of methadone and the potential for um, increased morbidity mortality resulted to, resulting from just the kinetics of the drug combined with benzos. Do you have anything to add here, Alexis? I was just going to say, and the reason we said especially for pain is that it's just people's tolerance um, and doses are very different when it's used uh, for opioid use disorder replacement. While we, and again, even in that population, we're trying to avoid benzodiazepines, but again, not um, we're not going to withhold um, opioid treatment because they're on or taking a benzodiazepine. Um, I think just continuing to stress, right? These are the idea, this is kind of, how we'd recommend you approach when considering starting a benzodiazepine or adjusting. Um, but certainly if someone's already on them, um, you know, in the fourth presentation we'll do, we'll talk about tapering and deprescribing um, and really hit home that you can do a lot more harm by decreasing or stopping too abruptly. Mm -hmm. um, and they have already built some tolerance. I guess one other thought I have about the risk when someone's been on them long-term is remembering that with age, right? Change in brain function and change in metabolism, um, th tolerance, things that were previously were tolerated can change. So that's another big factor to consider. Yeah. And I think the other piece that I would add to that we talk about more in this presentation a little bit later is just the use of the prescription drug monitoring program and urine drug screens should just always be done. So. Um, all, uh, there's a lot of data about the use of benzodiazepines and PTSD. I see this a lot at the VA. For many, many years, benzodiazepines were used to treat PTSD commonly, but over the years, what the data has shown is that there's no benefit for um, two PTSD symptoms uh, with uh, benzodiazepines, and they're also not useful in acute stress disorder as well. And in fact, it's really believed that benzodiazepines actually contribute to some of the core symptoms of PTSD, numbing and avoidance. It actually can make that worse. And the, the evidence level rating now for the D, from the DOD guidelines suggests that there's the potential for harm and that benzodiazepines may even diminish some of the benefits that people get from evidence-based psychotherapies. If you think about cognitive processing therapy or prolonged exposure therapy, these are really experiential treatments where the the provider wants the patient to dive in and sit with those uncomfortable feelings and really start to understand how they've influenced their beliefs and their actions and to really challenge those things and to not numb and avoid, but to lean into the discomfort, so to speak. And that benzodiazepines may inhibit some of the benefit that people get from therapies by causing that kind of a disconnection from the lived experience that therapy can bring. And so the VA and... Uh, DOD oh, advocates for SSRIs, mirtazapine, prazosin, and, and other forms of uh, psychotherapy, which we'll talk more about some of that here in a bit. Sorry, Alexis. You were oh yeah, there's, so one, I'll answer the questions more related to the, um, some of the opioid treatments and benzos a little bit later. Um, when someone had a question about when did the VA or, the, or was there a shift away from benzodiazepines for PTSD? I was going to say, I know that the 2010 mm -hmm. um, guideline from the VA certainly started to um, rec like recommend against benzodiazepines. I don't know if there was evidence before that. Yeah, that I, I know that there was some evidence. There was evidence before that, but it was really in the 2010 guidelines that the VA that, that they had like an explicit, you know, evidence level rating where they shifted where they were explicitly in like the made you know potential to harm category recommend against. Um. So, okay. Uh, we'll come to some of these questions later. They're great questions. I'm just taking a look here. Okay. Um, I may have to move. Oop, the screen's right in my way. Um, 
sorry, I went, went for it a little too fast. So um, in traumatic brain injury, TBI, there's also similarly guidelines um, that we should avoid medications that may cause confusion and or dizziness. I mean, so trying to avoid making symptoms worse that are already usually present um, in these um, conditions. And so that includes benzodiazepines, which can negatively affect cognitive and motor performance, um, could uh, potentially limit capacity for further recovery, especially if you can't really assess it properly because you have another medication on board that's um, exacerbating or confounding the symptoms. And then, it, and then you can see in, um, when you have any sort of, uh, uh, cognitive impairment and especially in a, a head injury, um, some people get a, almost a paradoxical reaction. So these medications that should be sedating or help, um, with, uh, inhibit, um, impulsive behavior can actually cause a disinhibition or like a, a what we call a paradoxical disinhibition to make people more agitated to agitated, aggravated, um, restless. Um, and sometimes that gets confused with, oh, we need to increase the dose rather than, oh, this is a adverse reaction to this medication. And then also on that list is any of the heavily anticholinergic, um, medications. With respect to the risk of benzodiazepines and dementia, this is something that we've heard a lot about. And there are a number of studies that have shown a positive association between the development of de dementia and the use of long-term benzodiazepines. And some eight of um, 15 studies identified in like a lit literature search have shown this like relationship, but it's not causal, right? It's more correlational than causal. And those studies to date are really designed to, to show causality but it's really believed at this point that there is some relationship between long-term use of benzodiazepines and the development of uh, dementia. And um, given the prevalence of benzodiazepine use among older adults, there's a, this is a particular concern and just the widespread use of long of of long-term benzodiazepines. So, and I think that this has been a really helpful thing to share with patients to motivate them to want to try something different. For people who've been on benzodiazepines long-term, pointing them to this uh, to this research has been uh, very useful. And sometimes I even liken it to that of cigarettes. There was a time in the history of this country when people, uh, physicians would recommend that people use cigarettes. And uh, then later on, we learned about the risk of causing cancer and all the other untoward effects of smoking cigarettes. And I've, I've likened benzodiazepines to this and for some patients to think that, you know, we didn't not, we don't always know about the consequences of like some of the treatments and we learn over time, um, unfortunately. And it's that, as Dr. Sturgis suggested, it's that if your problems didn't scare you, wait until you see our solutions. And that, that's been a really helpful thing to turn people on to, to get them for how intrinsically motivated to challenge the use of the benzos or be interested in a taper. I'll also mention, I mean, that what I'll tell patients is while, you know, the studies are not, um, are not confirmatory yet of a causation. There certainly seems to be some correlation and certainly we know it causes some, um, as people age, the benzodiazepines put them at increased risk for cognitive impairment, short-term memory issues. And I can say, I've seen patients on what most of us would not consider particularly high dose benzodiazepine, um, a patient that uh, was on one milligram of clonopin at bedtime um, and actually had only been on it, I think, a year, maybe max. And we were concerned with developing signs of cognitive impairment and getting beginning work up for um, dementia. And actually in slowly tapering them off the clonazepam saw their uh, memory normalize improve. So their MOCA went from abnormal to normal. Um, so like, I, I think, you know, not that that is going to be the case in everyone, um, but certainly we must think of these potentially um, as contributing and for some patients might be a very major, um, cause. So Oops, sorry. Both clicking at the same time. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, older adults may also be more susceptible to the, um, other effects of benzodiazepines, such as sedation, memory impairment, balance problems, as Alexis suggested and falls, which we know in elderly lead to mortality. So it, this is just a concerning population perhaps to use these medications in for a multitude of reasons. Uh, some of the suggestions, things you might consider just to manage this more safely is to use shorter acting agents versus longer acting agents. So there's less of a potential for accumulation. 
Um, also, you might consider using some of the benzodiazepines that don't have active metabolites that are less likely to accumulate. If you recall that in those individuals with hepatic impairment or elderly, that lorazepam, oxazepam, temazepam, or the, the acronym LOT, L-O-T, those are generally safer benzodiazepines for um, that population. And then uh, adolescents. So um, uh, as most of us uh, probably know, um, adolescence is a time of particularly rapid brain growth and remodeling, especially in the frontal lobe, which is, uh, as I like to put it for some of my patients, part of your braking system, right? And this is what helps you uh, put the brakes on things when you think you have a really great idea, but it's risky and it makes you kind of pause, slow down, think about what you're doing. Um, and, and over the course of adolescence, you know, being 12 to, you know, actually early adulthood brain development doesn't stop till 25. Um, you develop as that frontal lobe develops, increased cognitive control, ability to make decisions and decrease impulsivity and risk-taking. Um, in the frontal lobe, the GABA receptors um, that benzodiazepines work on um, reach adult le levels sometime in late adolescence. Um, I couldn't find good research and open if anyone knows it to actually look at the truth is not a lot of research has been done on the effect of benzodiazepines in adolescence because it's just generally been contraindicated. Um, my husband's a child psychiatrist and I asked him, he's like, we just don't, except for maybe in acute emergencies um, in patient, uh, they're just not prescribed in adolescence. Um, but I think one of the biggest reasons is because of that underdeveloped frontal lobe and increased impulsivity and risk-taking, um, adolescents are really at increased risk for misuse and eventually use disorder or addiction to benzodiazepines. And this is reflected in a 2018 survey of almost 30,000 high school students that found that almost 4% of US um, 10th and 12th graders had used a benzodiazepine non-medically. So gotten it from a friend or a family member um, and um, because they wanna try things and they um, hear that it can help or they're stressed out and it could help or they can't sleep. Um, and so to me, I mean, that's a big reason, uh, that we just, um, uh, really should, um, be avoiding these in adolescence with, um, you know, I'm sure there are some exceptions and then those should be made by, um, pediatric or child psychiatry and specialists. Um, and I guess we didn't have this on our list, but one of the other, uh, things we wanted to touch on was pregnancy and breastfeeding. Yeah. And so benzodiazepines, well, I will, first off, I'll note first and foremost that um, I still use some of the old pregnancy category ratings just because I think that that is still the way many people think about this. And it, you can, it still holds true to, in terms of like structuring your thought process. And it's still more common to see some of the resources described as still A, B, C, D, X rather than the newer model. So just acknowledging that first and foremost. But benzodiazepines are category D. There's con concern for cleft lip and cleft palate and other urogenital and neurological malformations with benzodiazepines during pregnancy. But some studies have also shown that, that there's not an increased risk with these complications compared to some of the older studies. But generally, it's recommended to taper patients off of benzodiazepines during pregnancy, and more rapid tapers uh, may, be, um, may be needed in some cases. Again, this is really a, comes down to that um, the cost benefit analysis that, you know, only the, the patient and that provider can do. You really do want to try to avoid benzodiazepines during the first trimester. That is thought to be when some of these abnormalities can occur. You want to minimize the use as much as possible. If it's appropriate to even convert PRN, right? If somebody's using chronic long-term benzos, it's actually not appropriate to convert them to PRN. That actually can open the door for a patient to have withdrawal. So you really have to be thinking about this from um, that perspective when I say that you might try to re relegate use to PRN, that may be inappropriate in and of itself, but you're really weighing the benefit versus the risk. Um, if, there can, uh, if the benzodiazepine is needed, you wanna consider, of course, a shorter half-life using as infrequently as possible. Granted, again, if they're using long-term, it might be more of a dose reduction. You can, in some circumstances, consider switching to other agents for anxiety. We're gonna talk more about that um, uh, and here in a moment about using other agents and we keep on mentioning the use of antidepressants, but we feel like that that's appropriate to talk more about here um, in a bit. 
Um, and then also you want to avoid use near the time of delivery. And this is because there is the potential that um, the newborn can have benzodiazepine in their system and can actually experience withdrawal. Um, and on a related note in breastfeeding, I think it's very important that, um, that patients understand that benzodiazepines can cross into the breast milk, um, that we don't have studies to tell us the long-term effects on infants. Um, and because it's getting into the breast milk, um, babies can experience sedation, respiratory depression, um, difficulty breastfeeding, and then kind of this overall muscular um, a hypotonia known as floppy baby syndrome. Um, so if, if it is deemed necessary to use one of these or one has, has been continued, um, trying to use an agent with the shorter half-life, um, especially keeping in mind that infants may not have yet developed the mechanisms, um, uh, especially in their liver to metabolize um, benzodiazepines uh, efficiently um, and therefore could experience a longer half-life and more of a buildup a build um, where it takes longer to wear off. We're going to now talk about some of the short-term and long-term consequences of benzodiazepine prescription use. And what I've listed here is sort of what I would consider to be the general side effects of these medicines. And some of the side effects are also sometimes the effect that you're looking for as well. So sedation uh, from these medications, you generally see uh, a tolerance to this within one to two weeks. That's why they're not always great medications. They're not great medications for long-term use of insomnia, excuse me, or anxiety. Memory impairments, uh, specifically deficits in episodic memory, it uh, prevents the formation of essentially of, of you coding things into your memory. And there's a positive association, as we've talked about, between benzodiazepines and the development of dementia. Unfortunately, when it comes to the memory impairing and the cognitive diminishing effects of benzodiazepine, we never really become tolerant to that, much like the risk of respiratory depression. There is also the risk for paradoxical stimulant effects. This is higher in some populations, such as the those individuals with a traumatic brain injury, also the elderly, but you can actually see a disinhibition is often the term that is used where people become activated from taking the benzo. We also know amnesia, which is sometimes strategically used, ataxia, confusion, dizziness, and muscle weakness, hence they're used sometimes as a muscle relaxant. So there are a number of uses of benzodiazepines and those can also potentially be the adverse effects of such medications as well. Um, also Im important to keep in mind um, that there are studies showing that there was an increased risk of suicidality and self-injurious behavior um, when looking, it was actually a review of published studies. So they saw a twofold to fourfold increased risk of suicidality and self-injurious behavior. And, um, you know, some of it is you of course have to look at what populations they're, they're studying and what other risk factors they have for suicide. And also consider that you're putting someone on a um, nervous system depressing medication um, that also uh, can decrease um, um, some of their ability to uh, use their frontal lobe and make, you know, think through decisions. Um, so I think also a really important thing to keep in mind. I know I had briefly mentioned earlier last week, and I um, want to restate this again this week. I didn't state this earlier in my introduction, but um, several years ago in about 2016, I started the benzodiazepine tapering clinic at the VA with uh, James Haug, who's an addiction psychiatrist and is the medical director for the outpatient substance use program at the VA. And um, so I, I wanted to say that in the context of this, but essentially that benzodiazepines have been known to um, potentially be related to depression. And so they've done some research where they've shown that um, in early phase one to four weeks, maybe there was some benefit to people who took benzodiazepines plus an antidepressant versus an antidepressant alone. But thereafter from five to 12 weeks and with long-term treatment greater than 12 weeks, there was no benefit uh, to adding a benzodiazepine and that combination treatment, they were just as likely to drop out from treatment as those individuals on an antidepressant alone. And so the, the authors of this particular article found that there are the potential benefits of combining antidepressant plus benzotherapy must be balanced very carefully against the harms of using um, you know, a benzodiazepine in any, in any circumstance. And also there, there's some thinking too that benzodiazepines like with PTSD contribute to those uh, numbing and contribute to avoidance. And same with, and as with depression, people feel maybe tired, less motivated, less active, harder to think, harder to focus, harder to concentrate. And these are some of the domains of 
depression. This is executive dysfunction. This is energia. This is anhedonia. And it, it's been my clinical experience that many people who get off of benzodiazepines in a really structured a setting with careful support and a careful and thoughtful taper feel better. Their depression actually improves. They're more engaged. They're more active. They think more clearly and that there's improvement um, in such symptoms over time. I mean, essentially, and remember to even think that a benzodiazepine is essentially a depressant. Um, we, we went ahead and added this slide after some of the discussion uh, last week and, and some of my ongoing consultation with my other colleagues um, doing this work and, and um, probably we'll go back and add it to our original when we re-record our first presentation. But do want to, you know, while for many uh, psychiatric disorders, most depressive disorders, anxiety disorders, PTSD, antidepressants, especially SSRIs, SNRIs, are our first line pharmacotherapy. Um, one, impress, impress upon everyone again that for most of these therapies, uh, there's other psychotherapies that are also first line um, and depending on severity of symptoms and access to care, um, may be tried before medication um, or concurrently. And they are overall um, safer than uh, benzodiazepines, um, but they do have a risk and they have a uh, risk for withdrawal, uh, also known in the literature as a discontinuation syndrome. Um, of course, that risk goes up if they're stopped abruptly, um, but there is even some more um, emerging research um, showing, and this was from a review, um, that, that people that do experience withdrawal from antidepressants, some of them, it can be quite, quite um, severe, debilitating, um, and can last a long time. And that's not what we're kind of initially taught or told, we don't um, explicitly tell patients. Um, so I think it is important to let them know, I mean, again, any medication you're taking on a regular basis that's affecting your brain and your nervous system can have this effect. Um, and it's always important. Um, I mean, I, I try to tell my patients this and why I don't want them to, if they, even if they think the medication's not working to stop it suddenly. Um, and instead for us to take a, a gradual approach, um, and make sure we're providing informed consent um, and providing education about the potential benefits um, versus um, potential risks of withdrawal. Um, and there's, there's increasingly some good um, literature on this. Um, this uh, Horowitz 2019 is a psychiatrist and, and um, a neuroscientist who's really started looking at overall withdrawal from psychiatric um, uh, medications and um, um, has some good um, data and thoughts, both with antidepressants, antipsychotics, and then kind of just in general. Um, so just wanted to call attention to that. Um, yeah, I really appreciate that, that um, point too, because I, when Alexis and I were talking about this after last, uh, the last presentation and a number of questions and thoughts came in, that it's certainly a lot, just in mentioning in a slide, the first line treatment for something as an SSRI, would, would not want to sound like cavalier about what that means to start an antidepressant, but those medications come with significant risk and there needs to be adequate education and informed consent. And there is very much the risk of withdrawal. And to the, his, to the point of history of, of psych, psychotropic medications, once that was understood that people could withdraw from benzodiazepines, a lot of the drug companies really shifted to prescribing antidepressants for anxiety, depression, the myriad of different disorders for which they had prescribed benzodiazepines before. And lo and behold, when they discovered that uh, antidepressants could produce a withdrawal syndrome, the drug companies became so concerned that that would affect the marketing and sales of antidepressants. They actually uh, sought to change the definition and change the name from withdrawal syndrome to discontinuation reaction, as if there was like a difference, some subtle difference. I know Heather Ashton did a lot of writing about like that very issue, but it's certainly not to be cavalier about putting that as like first line therapy. However, I, I do believe that the, they're very appropriate first line treatments for so many people. And I wouldn't discourage, you know, antidepressant use when they're, when they can be such helpful and useful medications and improve people's overall function. But they certainly have risks that are need to be considered as well. And it does, I saw a comment, it does vary just like any medication, right? They're not all the same. They're metabolized differently. They have different half-lives. Mm -hmm. um, things like paroxetine or venlafaxine certainly are known to even have interdose withdrawal um, for some folks because they have a much shorter half-life as opposed to fluoxetine. 
um, which you know you can have a patient take every other day and get a, a equivalent dose. So um, important to know that, but that's could be another presentation. Hello? All so, um, okay. This is me. Oh, someone is not muted. Um, um, so okay. uh, we'll follow up here, um, trying to characterize um, the difference between physical dependence, misuse, and addiction. Um, and I know we're starting to run low on time, so hopefully we'll get to more questions. But um, again, want to impart on everyone, you know, physical or physiologic dependence. Uh, can develop um, when you take, can develop when you're taking medication regularly or repeated within a few weeks or months. And there's different types of um, dependence um, people can develop, such as um, therapeutic dose dependence, um, uh, meaning you increasing, you get a, a physical dependence at a given dose or at a certain dose, um, getting a dependence to particularly high doses. Um, and then there's people that develop it um, in the setting of misuse or might go on to addiction. Um, but I think there can be a lot of misunderstanding and misuse of the terms um, to think that if you say someone has dependence and some of this comes out of the change in terminology from our Diag diagnostic statistical manual four to five, where addiction used to be called abuse and dependence and luckily they got rid of that, but that's still kind of stuck around. Um, and the truth, and now we call them use disorders and they're on a spectrum, depending on how many symptoms someone has from mild, moderate, severe. So I think whenever I say dependence, I make sure to say physical dependence or physiologic. So people know that's what I'm talking about. And the importance of knowing physical dependence to a substance, especially a prescription substance taken as prescribed um, is not addiction. It is not a use disorder. Um, because uh, you expect if someone's taking a medication regularly, depending on its mechanism, but that acts on your, um, for instance, on your nervous system, that you will develop some sort of physical dependence um, such that you may develop some tolerance or withdrawal. Again, depends on the exact mechanism of the medication where it works. Um, addiction, while physical dependence is part of the criteria, you must also develop some component of these other three criteria. And one way to just roughly think of them is the three C. So loss of control of use, um, consequences from your use, and this can include um, on your work, on your social activities, recreational activities, relationships, taking something despite knowing it's making your psychological health worse or your physical health worse or causing a problem with them, and then cravings or a strong desire or urge to use. Um, if you don't have at least one of those components, um, and you just have physical dependence, it is not um, a use disorder or addiction. Um, now, when we start, you know, it can book, there are gray areas with these medications. We saw this with opioids. Um, when we start worrying that someone's use is moving into the area of a use disorder or addiction would be, you know, they um, have uh, increased their dose um, that, and it was not as prescribed or in conversation with the prescriber and in agreement, um, or they're fluctuating their dose use, they're running out early, um, have an increasing sense that they need even more of the medication um, to function normally, feel like they um, completely are unable to, to cope without um, the medication, or especially more of the medication, and develop um, a strong desire or urge to use the medication and use more of it. Um, I guess another uh, description I like for addiction is it's um, continued use despite consequences. Now, again, people's use, we see this gray area, we see it, um, and, and certainly there's some people where maybe it hasn't fully moved into use disorder, but certainly it's starting to rise to the level where I'm starting to be concerned about that. Um, and that's where I think some of these conversations um, are important. There was a study done back in 2003, so this was under DSM-4 criteria, that did find that patients that were on um, a benzodiazepine or used one, whether prescribed or illicit, for more than a month, did actually meet criteria for um, what was then um, a substance dependence. Not necessarily meaning they actually all fully had an addiction, but just that, and, and the title of the article, I didn't put it here, it's on the reference list, is something like, um, benzodiazepine more psychologic dependence than physical or something. 
Um, I think it just, it tells us, right, for some patients, there is um, a continuum where this can move into a territory where it's misuse or moving into addiction. Um, we worry uh, that the, there's, or this study found increased risk with shorter half-lives, higher doses, and the longer someone used it. Again, just confirming, you know, safer prescribing would be if these are indicated to start, um, not to keep them beyond two to four weeks. But what I really want to press upon you is most patients that are prescribed benzodiazepines um, do not have a use disorder or addiction, um, and only very few are misusing them. Um, most of them are taking them as prescribed. We just prescribe a lot of them. Um, so um, in this study, 12.5% uh, of US adults were had been prescribed a benzodiazepine. Um, of those prescribed a benzodiazepine, 17% um, endorsed that they had misused it, so used it other than prescribed at some point. Um, and then 2% uh, of those with a benzodiazepine um, met criteria for a use disorder. So again, I think it's much smaller than, um, I think we've misconstrued the warnings and focused on this risk of addiction um, and really should be focusing first on educating people about the risk of physical dependence. Um, and the reasons individuals misused a benzodiazepine in the past year, I mean, is, is most of them are for reasons that um, people think of why they would want to use a um, benzodiazepine. So to relax or relieve tension, um, to help with sleep, right? First two, um, help with emotions, um, then 11% to get higher hooked, 5% um, to experiment, um, and then 1.5% to increase or decrease the effect of other um, uh, substances. Um, so, you know, one of the impressed things that we should be thinking about is whenever starting a medication that has a risk for physical dependence, and especially we know has that um, activation of the reward pathway in there, some um, risk of uh, misuse and, and potentially addiction, um, is that we are screening for risk of substance use disorder, both in someone's personal history and their family history. We know that a history of trauma further increases someone's risk of developing a substance use disorder. Um, using uh, the screening brief intervention referral to treatment uh, or the screening that is part of that um, to get a sense of their current substance use or recent substance use. Um, uh, uh, as Jeff mentioned, you know, reviewing the prescription monitor. I personally, whenever, regardless of whether it's in my addiction related work or general psychiatry, whenever I'm into the full prescription drug monitor and I check back all seven years to just get as complete a picture as possible of um, what has this patient been on? What, um, you know, am I missing any risk factors? Well, not just for addiction, really for, I mean, I'm worried about um, high risk medication combinations, um, fluctuations in doses. Again, um, trying to make sure patients understand the point is not to catch them. It's really that I want to understand what their risks are and what the risks of me prescribing something um, are going to be. And I know we're out of time, so I'll just let Jeff finish with the last, what I think are like two slides. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that I, I'm with and of the mindset that you want to get a urine drug screen and a, um, a prescription drug monitoring thing at, before you prescribe these medications, you know, and, and thereafter periodically on a schedule. And I'll, I'll tell you that this is somebody that I, I, I use this term when I'm talking to the residents and teaching them about this. I say for everyone always, and I tell the patients uh, this as well, for everyone always. Um, some years ago, I was working with a patient who was in his mid thirties, had two kids, came to me on 12 milligrams of clonazepam, wanting to get off, said he wanted to be more present as a father, just recently got promoted in his job, had a, um, was, was married and doing well. And his life felt like he was, um, he was thriving and was really motivated to get off of benzodiazepines. And I did not urine drug screen him and, uh, and found out later he was using cocaine and unrelated, um, but related he was using cocaine and had a bad outcome related to cocaine and developed an arrhythmia and ended up dying. A very young man, it was terribly sad. And I thought to myself, was this something that I could have seen and saw coming? And uh, could I have like, if I had drunk screened him earlier, then you know that could have been something that we could have offered him an intervention on. And I've really taken that to heart. And 
Um, I drug I drug screen everybody now. I know that some of my colleagues feel like it's a little bit strict, that I'm a little bit strict about it. But in the VA, you're really required to do it now. But even yet still, many folks are like, that's a pretty strict stance to take. But I don't want to leave it to my own projections and my own biases to decide who I'm going to drug screen and not. Because when you get into that game, I, I feel like it's hard to know. It's hard to then think about what I'm not perceiving. What are my subconscious biases that I, you know, in terms of like, why would I drug screen one person versus not another person? So for everyone, always. I had a Mormon veteran tell me, I find it insulting that you're drug screening me, Dr. Gold. I don't use any substances other than what's prescribed. And I consulted like about taking benzodiazepines like with my church. And I think it's insulting that you want me to do this. And I said, you know, it's the, much the same as asking people about suicidality. I do it for everyone at every appointment because I don't want to leave it to my own biases and projections as to like why I may not choose to test one person versus another. So it's something I do for everybody as a routine part of my practice. And I really encourage um, the people that I train to approach it that way as well for safety reasons. Um, also, just keep in mind that not all drug screens measure. Uh, they all look at different things. Generally, the drug screens, for, but you want to know what your lab actually picks up on. Generally, they're really good at testing for all the, the diazepam pathway. Like they all will test positive for that. Generally, clonazepam and lorazepam are notorious, though, for not showing up on a urine drug screen. So you really want to come to understand that not all of these um, lab assays are going to measure this. And you might become familiar with, like, what are the potential false um, false negatives as well as false positives. False positives can be things like such as sertraline is known to cause false positives for benzodiazepines, and there are a few others, um, less common uh, less common medications, but these are just some things you want to put um, to be aware of um, and have complete information and understanding of when you're talking with patients. Yeah, so I always tell people, I mean, get the package insert for the urine drug screen that your facility uses and actually look at it and understand it. Almost all urine drug screens are looking at exazepam and the long acting, the, the benzos that metabolize to that. And then it just tends to usually vary based on sensitivity of the urine drug screen, whether it might pick up. I've seen, I can't remember which is which Denver health. There was one they used that I want to say picked up alprazolam and you, uh, UC health had one that was more likely to pick up clonazepam, but that's not what it was screening for. So again, it's only a screen. If you get an unexpected result, um, then you need to do a confirmation. Um, or if you have a patient on clonazepam, alprazolam, lorazepam, then maybe you want to intermittently, um, send in a confirmation to make sure that you're seen um, and on there, don't, don't rely on the urine drug screen to show it. Um, or if it's not there to, to take that to mean that they're not taking their medication. Um, so I think that's a really important point. So I'm sorry that we ran, ran over and, and didn't get to all the questions. I certainly, I can stay for a few minutes. Um, uh, I know some folks. Um, I was also going to offer that what we might be able to do too, is that if anybody wants to email us the questions and then we could answer them and then send them out to everybody. Um, cause I see that there are quite a few. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, I, I think a lot of them, I mean, there's a question about marijuana and benzodiazepines. Um, the main concern is just, it's also a central nervous depressant. So you're combining those, um, um, uh, Jeff, are you aware of, are there any pharmacologic interactions? Not generally, not that I'm aware of. I think not it's that more, as you said, it's more like just sedating. And honestly, I think it's sort of a cultivation of, there's a similarity between, I think, benzodiazepines and marijuana use in some individuals. It's just a, a way to maybe um, escape some painful feelings. And again, that, that's really the opposite direction that the evidence-based psychotherapies would take somebody, you know, they, they want somebody to sit with the discomfort and to understand how it influences the choices they make and the feelings that they have and really wanting people to experience themselves and to feel and not to numb and avoid. And so I think there's a, there's a similarity to benzodiazepines and marijuana is that for some people that becomes a, a way that it's used, it, particularly in the population I see for veterans of PTSD. Um, I, I, I hear a lot of like similar ways in which benzodiazepines and marijuana are used. Um, uh, there's a question here about weaning. Um, so our fourth presentation in two, I guess, two weeks from today will be about deprescribing. Um, so I won't go into um, a great detail, but would say, um, you know, I, 
once they in the elderly, I, I mean, I where I've seen folks destabilized from decreasing or mm -hmm. decreasing too quickly. Um, so it's it's you go as super slowly and see if you can get them on less to decrease some of the risks, but sometimes the risk of destabilizing them or having them, I mean, I've seen folks become delirious or psychotic and yes. in being discontinued too quickly, especially in the elderly. So I think you just have to proceed super cautiously. Um, I also think too, would you say that in like a, that, like the advanced age, like 85, 90, sometimes I just think at that point, it's just more of a quality of life measure. I did the, yeah. some of the folks I work with from that population, it's, if there's not like a pressing behavioral or quality of life related concern that is directly related to their mental health, I, I just might, I might leave it. I just might leave it alone. I, again, I think that's one of those, you know, again, you know, relative contraindications. Yeah. I mean, it's gonna be different if they keep getting hospitalized because they're on both and they're becoming altered. And mm -hmm. um, there was a few other questions. I don't know if the folks that asked them are still here about um, Matt and benzodiazepines. I mean, I think you, again, if patients come to you already on a benzodiazepine and they're on medication for addiction treatment, I'm going to work to try to taper them. If they show that they have, um, that they're misusing or can't use the benzodiazepine as prescribed, then first I'll try to um, decrease the frequency of prescriptions. Um, and then if they, if, if it's evident to me, they also have a use disorder that benzo, then it becomes an issue of I have to, um, decrease it and take them off of it. Um, and it will just depend on how, how capable they are working with me, um, whether I can do that outpatient or whether they end up needing a treatment facility. Um, but if someone's been on them long-term and taking them responsibly, um, while again, it might've not been the ideal person to start them on, they're already on them. Um, I'm gonna work with them. So I think that's a good person for someone with addiction background to work with. Um, and then yes, the, the the partial opioid agonists are are safer than the full opioid agonists when it comes to risk of overdose. Um, so, okay, well, thank you all so much and hope to see you next week. Thank you everybody, appreciate you.